You are listening to the Lucha Central Podcast Network. And now, Lucha Central Weekly. You know, you can do you can you really have a Lucha Libre podcast without your mom doing uh vacuuming in the background? I don't think you can. Yeah. It's not possible. That adds as authenticity. And with that, <laughs> welcome to the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast. This is the <laughs> podcast that lets you know all of the latest happening in the world of Lucha Libre. Each week our team discusses news and events from this past week as well as preview the week ahead, covering Mexico-based promotions and top independents, along with Luchador-related news from throughout the United States. The Lucha Central Weekly Podcast is part of the Lucha Central Podcast Network on LuchaCentral.com. This podcast and others from the network are also available on all major podcast streaming platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, PodBay, and Speaker. And of course, we'd like to thank our partners at TheChairShot.com for streaming this show as well. My name is Miranda Morales, and I'm one of the co-hosts of the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast, and I'm going to bring in the rest of our team. Introducing first, well, he is the dashing one, Mr. Dusty Murphy. Dusty, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing, Miranda? I am doing well, doing well. And the third member of this trio is who? 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 It's the one and only Brendan Barr. That's who. That's right. I still have that nickname, despite having been in the same room with Conan on multiple occasions over <laughs> Las Vegas weekend. I have a, I have a feeling, <laughs> you know, we would all have that nickname with Conan, you know. He did We're it just, to somebody else too, so yeah, I just I was ready. Yeah, you're, just, you're right. I just just because you know he Conan's a busy man. He meets lots and lots of people all over uh-huh. the world. So I feel like even if we did have some face to face time, we would still be who oh, yeah. are these oh, people? Yeah. I just would. It would be more. It, I didn't get mine last time. That's how this all started. Yep. So once he does it to me, where he's just, I say my name and he says who back to me, that's, it's over. The, that's the gimmick it. is ruined. So. Yeah. So we, we got to <laughs> keep the, the gimmick rolling. We got to keep the gimmick rolling. Um, you know, I was going to transition into speaking of gimmicks, <laughs> but I don't know if this is a gimmick. It's not a gimmick. It, you know, this is a, a milestone for some people in professional wrestling, uh, to be included on this. It's something that's very, you know, highly anticipated and sought after every year. Some people think it's kind of gimmicky. Some people don't care, but you know, we got to start off with talking about Pro Wrestling Illustrated's PWI, of course. 500, the 2021 PWI 500 list. It is the top 500 wrestlers of the year. It runs from June 2020 to June 2021. Um, and of course, because we are the Lucha Central Wiggly podcast, we are going to focus on the luchadors on this list. And we are going to be referencing an article that you can find at our home at luchacentral.com written by the one and only Pep Carrera. Uh, of all of the luchadors ranked in the PWI 500 for 2021. And the headline for this, which I think is, you know, rightfully so. And, and again, it could be a question mark, an exclamation mark, a huh? Uh, as far as the top ranked luchador, pure luchador, and we'll talk about that, you know, preface in a second, um, is Ultimo Guerrero at number 17, which, uh, for I think some fans is is very high to see a luchador on, but also someone who worked exclusively for CMLL um, being the highest one on the list. I, I mean, the fact that it, a CMLL luchador is cracking the top twenty is pretty yes. pretty groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. Like, 
and like, and especially after the year they had with the well, yes. that was we, weekly pay per views and yeah, that was what I was gonna go on about. Like it's it's I I I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but it is a weird year for me to see this. Like Ultima Guerrero is a fine choice to crack the top twenty. He is an experienced guy. He's been there and done that. He's done a lot, but like. 2020 was not a big Ultima Guerrero mm-hmm. year. Yes. He had a feud with Euphoria as like his most memorable thing in 2020. And I mean, that was awesome. I loved it, but I'm, I don't, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and I want to preface as far as the highest ranking pure luchador because right before it at number 16 is Karrion Cross. Who, yes. again, you know, it varies on, on how you want to define him. He does have experience in Mexico, in Lucha Libre, but not a pure luchador like Ultimo Guerrero. So, um, that is why we start off here. That is why the Lucha Central article starts here. Yeah. Um, and, and goes a little bit further. At 22, we see Laredo Kid. At 41, Dragon Lee. And right behind him at 42, Hijo de Vikingo. 55 is Ray Phoenix, 57 Pagano, uh, 68 Caristico slash Mystico, uh, at 81 Santos Escobar, 103 Ray Mysterio, 115 Penta Cero M, uh, 119 Mystico slash Trolistico. <laughs> Uh, we untangled that yes. knot in a previous episode. Go back yeah. and listen yes, to that. Just listen to it. it oh, or just go to the memes because those are <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. Um, think if anything, this the the whole and situation has just been it. You know, <laughs> awesome for the memes. It's true. Uh, going back to the list at 127, Bandito, uh, 161, Euphoria, 166, Addis. 173 Gran Guerrero at 176 Andrade el Idolo, 177 Demonic Flamita, 183 Volador Jr., 196 LA Park, and 200 at Sanson. Further down, you know, there's, there's a lot more on this list, like Ehild at LA Park at 208, Psycho Clown at 212, mm. um, you know, <laughs> now one thing I do want to mention is La Hydra is on this list at 257. Yes. Um, yeah. and this is a rarity because there's only a handful of women on this list. So for one of those women, I believe there's only about seven. Period. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, it's not so just it's, lucha women. It's just no, exactly. Women. <laughs> just women, period. To have La Hydra on this list at 270, uh, 257, 257. Yeah. um, is a really outstanding showing. Yeah. Uh, for, for her and very rightfully deserved um, on that. So that's another interesting point. Um, I mean, you have Dr. Wagner Jr. at 290, um, you know, Gino Medina at 279, yeah. and friend of the show, Mr. Iguana, making his PWI 500 debut at 497. I do have to quickly correct you because it sounded much more impressive it's for gino medani medina was at 479 i'm sorry 479 yes yeah, yeah. a little um, number dyslexia as i was reading some of these <laughs> i i mean i just want us to um, i'm excited that he's on the list so uh, yes i was looking yes. right at it still still <laughs> great to have him so you know real quick thoughts on um you know the rankings of this list the luchadors any specific or the amount of luchadors and in this case luchadora on this list well uh one of the things i noticed when you were reading it off is uh vikingo did as we predicted last year come go rocketing up the ratings mm-hmm uh, anytime you talk to Conan about a luchador that is underrated that he wants to do more with, he almost always says Vikingo. So, yeah. uh, the world is paying attention. Uh, to swing back around to Ultimo a little more, uh, when you were reading that off, I noticed that his entire faction made the list. So, uh, whoever's looking at luchadors this year, uh, probably Matt Farmer, who does have participated with nominations, he did mention that. Mm-hmm. Uh, was looking at them and, and Euphoria is on the list as well. So the, the feud that, he's also in the faction. The feud is probably what fueled it. Just to give people a little more context, we did talk about that on this show. It's an interesting thing. CMLL has all that up there. Dusty, 
uh, I don't want to keep talking. So yeah, well, my big thing was Roosh. Last year, yeah. Roosh was the number, well, the highest luchador. He was number eighteen, and this year he's not even on the list. And and Ultimo Guerrero, he made quite a jump from fifty to seventeen. So the, yeah, I don't know. The the jump surprised me. Um, yeah, I loved it. Of course. Mr. Iguana, number 497. Yes. yes. One of my favorite parts. You know, love Mr. Iguana. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really exciting to see him kind of recognized for his talents in the ring because for as much of a novelty and a comedy act as we've seen, he's also done CZW and a lot of other stuff that's really physical and has like a martial arts <laughs> background. So it's really cool to see him chosen because he's such a well-rounded performer and he had such a great year last year that I that was the one I was most excited about personally. So they talked a lot, um, and we're going to get to this later, about, like, the work rate in 2020 and Roxy putting in more matches than anybody else. The other name that I always think of is 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 a Mr. Iguana. We saw mm-hmm. – we were always able to – at every event, there was a Mr. Iguana match. Like, he managed to find a way to be relevant throughout all of 2020. So, yeah, like, well-deserved. Probably should even Absolutely. be higher, but... uh He should. You know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, if all you watched last year of Mr. Iguana was, like, the Lucha Fighter and then maybe Triple A or the Triple Mania, um, you wouldn't have a very rounded view of him and what he could do. I think it would still merit inclusion, but for those of us that are kind of hip to everything that he does, it, it does seem like he should be quite a bit higher this year. Yeah, because he, he still seized had every, every opportunity. He drove every yeah. mile. Like he was there. He still had a really good match to go all the way back to that Lucha Fighter. Like his yes. uh, first round match at Lucha Fighter was. Way more than just him being a comedy guy. He, it was a really good match. So. It was incredible. And um, Yeska yeah. really got over at the time too. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. That was, I mean, you talk about people that grabbed the brass ring. He grabbed yeah. that brass ring with Lucha Fighter in the COVID era. He was, yeah. he had TikTok. He's got Instagram. He's got YouTube. I mean, he, he really seized that opportunity yeah. well. So one other name that I want to give attention to is uh, 406 Hijo de Canis Lupus. Um, yes. We've talked a lot about him on the Indie Roundup. It excites me a lot that he made the cut because he is uh, he's an, a, an exciting up and coming wrestler, but he's doing it all through Mexico because 2020 he had to do it in Mexico. So I'm shocked and surprised that he made it on the list because his exposure hasn't been as good. Uh, hopefully that means we will see him. Hopefully that you know, people bring him north, maybe on the Texas side, maybe on the California side, but you know, bring him north of the border and and work with him. I I want to see more of him. Yes, I I definitely uh, agree with that, and I think it's also a sign of just um like we've talked about with Mr. Iguana, just any time an independent in the U.S. especially can bring on a luchador or give them a format uh, or, or uh, a format to wrestle i mean we've seen it with galley uh local wrestling too out of texas is is big of course california now coming back up we're starting to see more promotions uh come back i think that all of these names have the potential to move oh, yeah. up with that you know bigger visibility here in the states mr iguana i feel like is one of those who really was able to capitalize on it he went from anywhere from Chicago to California to Texas, you know, really much, pretty mm-hmm. much anywhere. Um, and because he has a look and style that, you know, is beyond words and language, it's a it's a character, um, but also in the ring, um, you know, he has an amazing quick ability that seems to work well with a lot of people. Um, and I think even seeing like the, you know, Santos Escobar at 81 um, for you know, being within the WWE system is still a really good showing for him, still making top 100. Um, it yeah. will be very interesting as we talk more about NXT, you know, where he falls, you know, this time next year, um, because they do seem to really be pulling him as one of those bigger storylines in NXT. 
Um, and if that continues to happen, you know, will that he, he become really, you know, a pillar of NXT or will he then eventually move up to Raw or SmackDown? And we all know how that goes. Uh, well, it could even be worse now, but uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So yeah. So, and even the ability of seeing, you know, uh, what MLW can do, um, you know, Ejo de LA Park being one of them, um, mm-hmm. same thing with even Laredo Kid, you know, uh, we'll talk about it later, but, you know, he's still making his waves throughout the scene here in the United States, um, that could, you know, mean that we see him again in MLW, um, but I think yep. that involvement in, you know, bigger promotions will help, uh, a, a lot yeah. of people on on this list, especially, and this could be where the wild card happens. If we do see, you know, Azteca Underground really form yep. and build up, will that really build out the profile of luchadors? And well, like, would an Adi's be able to move up in the rankings from 166 to you know even 20 spots next year? Um, I'm, I'm looking at this list, and that's where yeah. I'm seeing the most upward potential. Yeah. Um uh, like Gino Medina, Adi's, uh the the parks, uh like Gino. I think, think he could be easily be top. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. get to that. We'll get to that. He's definitely on pace for a good year. He's the one that's <laughs> not in MLW that is also that's gonna true. probably have yeah. big big movement. But well, uh, I mean even then too, seeing like a Ray and Penta, you know, Ray and there's a pretty big gap between Ray and Penta. Uh, Fe- Ray is at 55 and Pent is at 115. Yeah, Ray uh, Phoenix. Yeah. We, we yeah. need to specify because Ray Mysterio is also at 103. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I meant Ray to Phoenix. say Ray Phoenix. Yeah. Yes, I meant to say Ray <laughs> Phoenix, not Ray Mysterio. Ray Mysterio, <laughs> that actually makes sense. Um, just I because I. Did he fall the, off the top 100 this year? Yes. Gonna, I believe yeah. he did, yeah. Yeah, he was 43 last year. And he was. Yeah, I mean, like, he was just not in great storylines, honestly, for 2020. There was that terrible Extreme Rules coming up has reminded me of it constantly. We, we had that eye for an eye match, and that oh, really – He I had still actually, has stink on him. I had actually purged that from my brain until you said that, Dusty. <laughs> like, I had completely managed to forget about that horrible match. Oh, man. Anyway, so, you know, we, we could truly talk about this for the entirety of the show because there is so much to untangle and, you know, discuss. But we have a whole packed show for you this week. Um, so go ahead and check out this article. It is at LuchaCentral.com by Pep Carrera. Uh, and it is listed as Ultimo Guerrero, the best ranked luchador in the 2021 PWI 500. We'll give out our contact information at the end of the show, but let us know what you think of the rankings this year of the luchadors on this list. Was there anybody else that was missed? Is there someone too high, too low? Let us know, because that is a full conversation in and of itself. But we got a lot to touch on. So we are going to start our show, as we always do, with the road back to shows with Brendan. So I'm going to take the first 30 seconds to swing back around there. Don't make the mistake I did. If you see a picture of Roosh when you're looking for the, (laughs) the article, you've got last year's PWI article. This year has a picture of Ultimo Guerrero on it. Just so it you- happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I mean, I'm barely, I'm just going to mention it out of formality. Mexico is still running shows. I, I mean, I didn't even look up if they were orange or red this week because they're running shows as normal, so it doesn't impact us right now. Um, what does impact us is that Mexican Independence Day. Uh, was Thursday because this, that, that day will be in the past by the time you hear this. Uh, there are a number of bigger cards that are going to be happening. Uh, there's a number of things. So listen, ne- next week we should have a whole bunch in the indie roundup as well as CMLL news. Uh, I bet AAA even sneaks in a little something. Uh, unfortunately I can't talk a lot about it today because it hasn't happened in its entirety as of this recording so we will be looking ahead at that point uh thing that has happened did actually happen was Sam Adonis 
put a picture up on his socials of him presenting the Luchador Award to uh, Rey Mysterio, now that we've specified the, which Rey we need to talk <laughs> about here. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, which was me to be at the beginning of this, the Cauliflower Alley Club is a non-profit uh, wrestling based promote uh, operation their their specialty is uh is helping retired wrestlers with medical procedures or uh recently passed away wrestlers family having a little extra money in their pocket to handle the unfortunate reality that uh, that will happen there so uh they have a have an annual award ever award ceremony every year you don't have to be a member to win so uh I don't know. I'm guessing Sam Adonis probably is based on his family history. Yeah. <laughs> uh but uh I don't think Ray is necessarily a member. But uh he he did get the Luchador award for the year which was presented to him by Sam Adonis. There's a very nice picture of the two of them posing with it. I'm just going to attack you guys with the box text and read what the Lucha Libre award is here. So it's an honor given to an individual who's had prominent, had a prominent career in the Lucha Libre style of professional wrestling. And in all Lucha Libre award nominees must have been considered an outstanding performer of Latino heritage or has trained or performed in Mexico or elsewhere in the Lucha Libre style. Any and all of the nominees must have been well known to the Lucha Libre f- Fan base winner wherever they have performed. This award is award is not restricted to those who worked solely in Mexico, nor is it limited to mass wrestlers. But any wrestler who worked the lucha libre style in any part of the world is eligible for nomination. So that's very much in a nutshell how we approach the lucha. What is a luchador on this show? Like I've never seen a better written out example of kind of what we we talk about. When we're talking about is this lucha content, do we want to bring it to you? I just, so it's kind of why I wanted to read that out loud. Um, obviously, Rey Mysterio is the embodiment of lucha libre in this generation. Like uh, you can't talk about that without somebody saying, "Is that Rey Mysterio?" So I mean, this is a hands down slam dunk of an award. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to him congratulations to sam adonis for being able to pose in a picture with him and shake his hand because i know that was a goal of his i guarantee it um very cool just all around really cool and i i guarantee that uh now that ray is aware if he wasn't aware of the cauliflower alley club that he will be a supporter of them i certainly am gonna be sending them a few bucks every year now because i think that's a very cool not-for-profit organization to support. Yeah. Uh, Cauliflower Alley Club. Uh, I didn't have the foresight to save the actual website, but that's what I Googled, and it was the, the top result. So if you guys want to support them, that's that's where they're at, Cauliflower Alley Club. Or, you know, bug Sam Madonis on social media. He'll probably answer that question. Uh, I was going to mention that <laughs> this is the first um, – event that they've had they usually host an annual um award ceremony every year in las vegas they had to cancel the one last year due to the pandemic um but so it was a big return for everyone um i'm sure involved in the cauliflower alley club and um they make you know finding them online pretty easy it's mm-hmm. cauliflower alley club dot org so dot org there we yes, go dot I, org. I, I, I would have been good if I had guessed, but yeah. And they're also <laughs> on Facebook. They're also on different forms yes. of social media. Um, and of course, you know, they give out awards every year. I believe also Medusa was honored. Um, and mm-hmm. several others were honored this year. Um, and it just, you know, it's one of those formal recognitions in wrestling that, um, I think really means a lot to those involved. Um, and again, it does also help raise money and funds for those within the world of professional wrestling, but to have a, a specific Lucha Libre award, award as well, I think is really cool because it's just really that recognition and validation of Lucha Libre as such an important form of wrestling. Yeah, and honestly, if you look at the other awards that are given out, it's pretty much the only one of its kind. Like, 
Most of the others are in memorial to uh, a wrestler that was a legend in a previous time. Uh, this is the only one that really recognizes a specific style and and emphasizes that. So I think that's kind of cool, too, that, that Lucha Libre is, is so present in American pro wrestling culture that it, it's, it deserves its own standout award. Uh, and moving from that to other, uh, uh, interesting, but more like take my money news, um, Nike launched a line of luchador shoes this yeah this, yeah yay see, see Dusty's already been yeah <laughs> Dusty, I know. Dusty is the stylish one of them but you have to, <laughs> Dusty has style I I am actually going to pick up my first pair of Nike in Nikes in years because I'm going to buy one of those uh there's there's two different styles that I saw when I was at looking for shopping and and there's one that has little masks on the on the face of it and i'm gonna be wearing so uh i'll I'll probably have some some nice kicks at expo lucha i think that's the first time i'll put those on my feet (laughs) yeah i'm gonna get the blazer lucha libre that look like jake snake's ear with the rattlesnake skin and the yeah 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 there's some really good stuff so uh the timeline was they were available only in Mexico, but that even as at the time of this recording, that has already passed. Uh, they they are by the time your ears hear this, they will be available globally anywhere you can buy Nike shoes. So you should be able to find them if you want them. Um, I'm uh, very very tempted because I'm in Seattle and there's a Nike town. I'm very tempted to just go in there and just yeah. Just see them in their natural environment before I buy a pair. But yeah. I'll, yeah, super cool. I'm normally not the fashion guy, so you know, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm taking a minute, they're they're probably pretty cool. Um, and then the last thing I've got for the indie roundup was just a random couple of interviews that got collected together. So Gravity uh, has said that his dream. In an interview, he said his dream is to make it to PWG. And then Emperor Azteca also said, and, and similarly, that he hopes to make it to Ring of Honor or New Japan. Um, this is this is a very interesting thing to me because much like in America, most luchadors in Mexico, even as recently as five years ago, would say CMLL or AAA. Like that would be their end goal. Um, so I just kind of, it's, it's an interesting shift. Um, I, 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 these are definitely both kind of really younger guys. So, you know, I don't know if it's that the, because they're so young or if that's if the, uh, the lucha culture is kind of shifting in general. But I, I had mentioned this to the, to the group and I figured we would have a quick little conversation on this. So, uh, I'm going to start with Miranda because I normally kick it over to Dusty. Uh, Miranda, well, do you have any thoughts on just kind of this general idea? Well, I think in general, I mean, it's a good point because I think we're seeing the landscape of wrestling change so much that now there are a lot more options available, you know, having and I feel like there's almost a parallel now between that and WWE, whereas for a long time wrestlers, you know, would say that the goal is to make it to WWE. But now, depending on what you want to do. You know, that mm-hmm. may not be the option. Yeah. Maybe it is AEW. Maybe it is having a successful, you know, run in the, in the independence. Maybe it is MLW, you know, like, mm-hmm. and we're, and we're seeing people who don't want to necessarily go straight to WWE or there at all. So I think in a very parallel mm-hmm. tone where the ultimate goal for a lot of the luchadors was to go to CMLL or AAA, knowing that being on the independent scene, especially in the United States, can be just as lucrative, just as, you know, you can get those eyes on you. Um, and ultimately, if that is an easier step for them to make it to, say, AEW, you you know, like that may that may be where it's not just working in AAA or CMLM anymore. It's being able to work within a U.S. audience or U.S. promotions that are going to get you the visibility you need to make it to 
a, you know, a, a U.S. promotion. So I just feel like we're we're living in a time now where there's uh, so many options and goals vary, and you know how you play a game of chess in a way. Um, and and I and I don't know if that's the ultimate goal as far as you know the big pie in the sky dream or what is the ideal, but I do think that. Um, you know, going to AAA or CMLL, though it is very lucrative and great for a Lucha Libre audience, a Mexican audience, a Latin American audience. If your goal is to go bigger or to, to be in the United States or to wrestle, you know, in more unique promotions, a PWG is a, is a much better place to do that. It's true. Yeah. Dusty, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I I agree with Miranda. You know, WWE for so long it felt like that was like the choice for so many people, but now I'm uh, I don't I don't necessarily think it's the number one choice for a lot of people anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before AEW, we saw with the Young Bucks and you know some other people. The, I'm not going to name names, but th- <laughs> we saw that you don't have to be signed to a company to be able to afford to buy a nice house in some expensive place like California. If you are over enough on the mm-hmm. indies, you can make that your thing, and so. I kind of feel like that's what we're missing right now, too, is that we've got AEW, which is like the super indie. They've got all the indie guys that were so cool like three, five years ago. But, like, the indies feel more depleted than ever. And with every release from WWE, people are like, oh, I bet they go to AEW. And every time I think, I hope they go to the indies. Because we need these guys on the indies that can kind of build up their reputations and kind of prop the indies up for a while again as the new superstars. So mm-hmm. I'm really hoping that, you know, we see a resurgence of the indie scene and indie wrestlers for a while. Well, I've got good news for you. Uh, I mean, I know we talked about this, but I'm, I'm just teasing it for later anyway. There, there were some releases that showed up at not AEW this week, and and uh, I was excited for the same Very reason. Exciting, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. In general, I, I mean, so I, I recognize that uh, Avispa Dorada is kind of the, a weird exception anyway. She didn't, but she was, uh, had said to me several times she's not interested in WWD, WWE. She wanted to go to CMLL. Uh, but I, I feel like with that, that was also representative of us being more global now. Like, you know, you, you know, you can have an American wrestler or an American person start wrestling school and set a goal that says, I want to go to New Japan or I want to go to CMLL and not even worry about stopping over at WWE as part of that. Cause that would have originally been, been part of the destination. Like how you get, no, you're, you're big enough is you go to WWE for a hot minute and then you go back to the Indies and that's what usually when New Japan or CMLL or Triple A would would uh, give you a much more open invitation, but uh, these alliances with uh, MLW and um, and and uh, New Japan and and others are really kind of making it so that you can be all kinds of go all kinds of way. I just thought it was very interesting. Um, Gravity and Emperor Azteca, you guys are actually both on pace to be much bigger than the, uh, than the, the, the rather short term goals that you've set. So, you know, I, I wish you guys luck, but I hope that you've got a step after that because as cool as PWG and ROH are, like, you know, the the general indie circuit in general is right now is just awesome. Just being look at how good that was for Mexiblood. You know they they turned that into into a career before they and they're they're still kind of indie guys, but they're also pretty notable figures on ROH. Um, cool. Any any guys any last minute thoughts, guys? Or um, otherwise we'll just kick it over to the indie roundup. All right, Dusty, in my head, you're still singing me over to the Indie Roundup. Yeah. We don't... <laughs> we'll have to have a special episode where I play it in live. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We can, yes. we can yeah. set that. Maybe when we do one of these live podcasts somewhere. Yeah. Can... <laughs> It'll be fun. 
Um, so as we mentioned last week and several weeks before that, uh, 9-11 had a lot of wrestling that was going on. So I'm going to go over what happened at the crash. Um, that was, uh, 9-11 at the Auditorio di Tijuana in, uh, Baja, California, which is in Mexico. Always confuses me. <laughs> uh, look at a map sometimes, kids. It's, it's helpful. I, I should have done that much more often. Uh, they had five matches. Uh, there was some border issues. So, uh, there were a couple people who were on the, the card that didn't make it. Remember in wrestling, the card is always subject to change. Uh, first match we had Kamikaze, Scalibur, and Torito Negro against Proximo. Terror Azteca and Toto and Kamikaze, Scalibur and Torito Negro came out on top on that one. Then you had Black Danger and Dina Miko in a, a tag match against Baby Extreme and El Drago. Uh, so this is basically two Mexico City indie guys against two, uh, North Indie guys and the, uh, Black Danger and Dinamico came out on top of this one. I haven't seen any of this card yet, but that might be a sleeper pick for a really good match because Baby Extreme is a guy that's worth watching. Black Danger is a guy that is amazing to watch. Uh, I think he's done Expo Lucha at least one year, so there's footage out there for you to watch. Um, Third match, we had Carto Brava Jr., Mocha Cota Jr., and Tito Santana, that Tito Santana, uh, against uh, Black Destiny, Mr. Iguana, and Nino Hamburguesa. Um, shockingly to me, the guys that are tr- actual trio, Carto Brava Jr., Mocha Cota Jr., and Tito Santana, actually won this time. Usually, they... uh you know, well, they've, they've been on a huge winning streak, so they, it makes sense. Also, uh, they're kind of building up a little, uh, triple A feud, in my opinion, because you'll see more of this in the later part of this card. But, uh, then we had, uh, Io del Vikingo against Black Taurus. This is one of the ones that was changed last minute. Uh, Vikingo did come out on top of that, uh, apparently with a pretty spectacular splash off of the top rope. Uh, and then, oh, I'm sorry, there were six matches. My notes were broken up. Uh, this, then, uh, in match five, so the semi-main, you had Bestia666, Mecha Wolf, Ray Orus against, uh, Quatrero, Forastro, and Sanson, and GD. And this is where we started getting some more storyline in there. Poder del Norte came out with Conan, interfered in the match. Bestia 666, Mecha Wolf, and Ray Orus came out on top. Uh, and then you have your main event, which features Andrade, Laredo Kid. Um, okay. Quick survey. Who do you guys think won? Laredo. Yes. No, that it was one? Andrade. Oh. oh. That was my second choice. Yes. <laughs> I, I was 50-50 on this one. I'm a little surprised, actually, that Andrade won because Laredo's kind of got the momentum. He, we know he's a, Conan really likes him. I don't know that he's the, the booker at the crash, but he's definitely working with the crash. Yeah, Andrade came out on top on this one. Um, there was some more shenanigans with Poder del Norte and, and, uh, the, uh, Nueva Generation de Amita after this match. But, uh, it's more like they're setting up more matches for the crash. But this feud between Poder del Norte and NGD seems to be going anywhere they're in the same building. Seems like they're gonna be involved. And Conan now too. So um good stuff. Also on nine eleven, uh we had a Mass Republic show at the Agua Caliente uh casino. Um I wasn't there but Miranda was, so I'm gonna let her talk about this one. 
Yes, so the show Lucha Libre Mexicana was at the Agua Caliente Casino in Cathedral City, California. Um, it was a very great turnout. I believe uh, close to 300 tickets were sold uh, for sold the out. event. Yeah, sold out. Sold out. This went by um, her. Yeah. Yeah, sold out per the casino um, is, is what we're told. So um, I was very fortunate enough to bring out for that show. Um, and it was definitely very ex- exciting and, um, you know, something for the, the local community to experience. Um, this show had five matches. Um, our opening bout was a four corners match um, featuring Reptilio versus Premio Genio Tribeca versus Remy Marcel versus Koto Hero. Um, and the winner of that match was Koto Hero um, in the end. And so I believe he pinned Primo Henio Tribeca uh, for that. But it was a single pinfall. Um, and, you know, all of these guys definitely had to find the right opportunities to take their shots um, in this match. Because, you know, and of course, you know, in a four way or four corners match, you definitely have to keep your eye out really on, you know, the eyes in the back of your head. Um, and, you know, having, uh, I think, the hybrid skills of Koto Hiro, the experience of someone like Remy Marcel, you know, the attitude of Promoheno Trebeca, and, of course, kind of the unpredictability of Reptilio uh, made this a really fun and entertaining match to watch. Um, up next, we had a women's tag match. Uh, the team of Amazona and Milo versus Viva Van, who we had interviewed on the show recently, and making her U.S. debut, Baronessa. Um, and Baronessa and Viva Van won that match. Um, these women got aggressive. They took the action outside uh, of the ring, um, and we had a great spot where Baronessa, I believe it was Baronessa, uh, jumped off the ring apron uh, onto Amazona. And, um, you know, Milo is, as she's just a, a adorable with a lot of spunk and attitude. Uh, but Viva Van was very heavy metal and brought that attitude herself into this match. Um, up next, we had another tag match and this was, uh, Guerrero Imperial and Ma- Nightmare Azteca versus, uh, Monster Junior or Monster Segundo and his tag team partner, Gentleman Jervis, which, if you know anything about Gentleman Jervis, is kind of a yeah. an odd pairing. That with is a Monster, very odd pair. Yeah, Monster he used to be Jr. Jervis Cottonbelly. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Jervis Cottonbelly in, in Jakara. Um, the team of Jervis and Monster Jr. won that match. Uh, the crowd really did love the interactions and spots uh, with all four of these guys, but especially with Jervis um, in the ring. Um, and this one, too, again, it was very different as far as, you know, even Guerrero Imperial and Nightmare Azteca, um, you know, really were very intense um, throughout their match. And so having and even Monster Jr. is as well. So having yeah, kind yeah. Of the lightheartedness of Gentleman Jarvis broke, broke up, some, you know, some of that that spookiness. Um, yeah, he, he's the odd man out in that matchup, which is. Yes. Probably just added to it. I, I'm imagining a very fun match. Yes. Uh, after that, we had our semi-main event, which was a triple threat match. Uh, Super Astro Jr. making his U.S. debut versus Ray Leon versus Psychosis. Uh, the legend from ECW, WCW, WWE um, in the ring. And um, their... I mean, really, a lot of this came down between Super Astro Jr. and Psychosis. So the match ended with Super Astro winning, pinning Ray Leon. However, or not pinning, I'm sorry, there was a, a tap out. Um, and then Psychosis looking at the situation saying, well, I wasn't pinned. I didn't tap out. Let's keep this match going. 
So uh, Psychosis attempted to get the match restarted, even tempting Super Astro Jr. with an apuesta for Mask vs. Mask, um, just to try to, to deepen the pot and stir the pot even more. Um, the referee obliged for, you know, five more minutes, and, you know, Super Astro Jr. won again. There was no, you know, the stipulation wasn't final. I think Psychosis had did that to really just egg on Super Astro Jr., um, um, but a very impressive win for Super Astro, essentially not only p- pinning Ray Leon, but also Psychosis. Um, and then in our main event, we had the father and son team of Solar and Solar Jr. versus Pirata Morgan and Misterioso. And this match ended in a draw. There was a pin attempt that was inconclusive and the two teams fought and just chaos erupted. And, and we did not have a conclusive winner. Um, this led to Solar Jr. and Pirata Morgan at the end of the match, um, you know, trying, essentially giving respect to each other as the veterans in this match, um, to, and, and possibly, you know, trying to see if they could one day face each other in the ring again. It looked like we were heading into kind of another quick rematch, but ultimately the two men, you know, recognized that the point was to give an entertaining show for the fans there, uh, to bring pride to Lucha Libre, and they felt that that was done through their match. But it's not done yet. I mean, next time they mentioned the next time they see each other, the next time they have an opportunity to wrestle, they are going to take it, and they are going to want to have a conclusive winner. So um, that is your Lucha Libre Mexicana show um, from this past week. Also to note that there could be more Lucha Libre Mexicana shows to come in the future. Um, so make sure you stay tuned to Mass Republic uh, and, of course, the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast for more information. Um, and maybe next time you can check out this show um, and because there's even more talent uh, that will be featured in the future yeah. with Lucha Libre Mexicana. A lot of those people that got visas were at the – crash show yes. so yes uh, there were there were a lot of mass republic people that were just unavailable for the show and we still got an amazing card out of it um i will point out that uh the solar family and Pioretta morgan are mainstays at expo lucha uh, and, and so much so that they've all they're also regulars at the expo lucha uh lucha bowling event so oh. Look for this feud to spill over to the bowling alley because the first thing I learned about Solar and Solar Jr. is they're super competitive at bowling. <laughs> like they didn't even care that I was there. They were trying to beat each other at bowling. That was one of my favorite moments. Just like he he was uh, he kept uh, saying he ho I'm going to beat you, and uh, I'm not going to mention who won or lost uh, against those two. But uh, they they wanted they even at bowling. They were competitive with each yeah. other. So, <laughs> I just love the idea that they go out there and settle it on the lanes. Yes, it, right. I just uh, let's I'm, take I'm, it to the hardwood. I'm pitching this forward, <laughs> right? Uh, make it happen, Ruben. I know that's that's a Ruben thing. So make yeah. have the have them settle the score in the bowling alley or set up the feud in the bowling alley. That'd be great too. Yeah, we need Luchador <laughs> Disco Bowling, <or> Laser <laughs> Bowling, whatever they call it now. Oh, after dark, I think. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the wrap up, Miranda. It sounds like you had a good time. Did you spend? Did you win any money at the casino? I did not. No. Oh. Uh, so uh, it 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 wasn't uh, meant to be. But hopefully, <laughs> if I return next time, I'll, I'll try again. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully we have more events at there or at other casinos. Um, I do want to mention that we still are building up. Pro Wrestling Revolution is just two weeks away, so we'll, uh, we're almost there. They, uh, they, they have a pretty loaded card as well, which is featuring people like the Parks, the, um, uh, Rayo de Jalisco, uh, it's going to be a very exciting card. And you, we, we mentioned Viva Van. She's going to be at the PCW Ultra Return, which is on October 22nd. And uh, we don't know in what capacity, but the, the weekly show is going to be uh, present at both of these. So, you know, we will definitely be bringing you results from that. 
Uh, I wanted to focus this week on our 9-11 madness, uh, but there's always lots of stuff. So I always, like I say, send me your links. Send me your your stuff. Uh, if you want to hear more about IWRG or other big name indies, let us know that too, and we will make sure to keep whatever you want in the show to keep you happy. That's my uh, my uh, lucha my indie roundup for the week. Well, thank you, Brendan, for both the Road Back to Shows and the Indie Roundup. Up next, well, you know what time it is. It's time to kick it off to Denise Salcedo, who brings us this week's Lucha Central Central. Why should you visit TheChairShot.com? TheChairShot.com is your home for hard-hitting reviews, news, opinion, and analysis with attitude. Why? Because you're smarter than the average fan. TheChairShot.com Always use your head Hey everyone, it's Denise Salcedo here in Lucha Central Central with a reminder of where and when to catch all of the great network content this week Get the full lineup and listen to all of our shows in the podcast network section of LuchaCentral.com On Tuesdays Math, Max, and Mayhem takes you inside the world of Lucha Underground as they take you weekly through the series with the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of special guests from the groundbreaking series. Check out the premiere video stream every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on the Lucha Central YouTube channel and at LuchaCentral.com. Then listen to it on your favorite podcast platform every Wednesday. Tuesday nights live, it's WrestleBoss, where Fabi Chulo talks MMA and pro wrestling with special guests and listener Collins. Visit WrestleBossLive.com Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific to listen live or call in with questions or download the show on podcast platforms on Wednesdays. Wednesday nights live on Facebook, it's Spanish show La Mesa de los Margaros, giving you both the news and the cheese made from around the lucha world. Special guests and a whole lot of fun make it one of the most talked about shows in Mexico. Thursdays, it's straight out of the bodega with Papo Esco and PWR promoter Gabriel Ramirez as they have guests from throughout the wrestling world pull up to give an inside look into their careers. From indie standouts to television superstars, each week brings a new name and perspective. On Friday, it's your double dose of Lucha Central weekly podcast, one in English y el otro en español. Lucha Central Weekly is where you'll find all the top stories of the week, both inside and out of the ring from Mexico and anywhere luchadores are in action across the globe. Be sure to subscribe and follow all your favorite Lucha Central Network series on your favorite podcast platforms, either by their own series name or subscribe to the Lucha Central Podcast Network show pages to get all of the shows in one easy feed. And please consider giving a rating to help more fans find the shows that you love. For now, this is Denise Salcedo signing off from Lucha Central Central. Have a great week. Lucha-Masks.com by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Bringing you in partnership with Mask Republic. The Lucha Brothers, as well as Japanese legend Ultimo Dragon. Go to lucha-masks.com and fight Lucha Strong with masks from your favorite Lucha legends and pro wrestling revolution luchadores. Stay safe in style and represent your favorite luchador. Get yours now at lucha-masks.com, powered by Pro Wrestling Revolution. And a big thank you to Denise Salcedo bringing us this week's Lucha Central 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 Lucha Central Central, Easy letting for you, you to know, say. <laughs> letting you know what's happening throughout the Lucha Central podcast network. Denise and I have heat this week. I, I'm oh. heated. <laughs> so you just you, you're just gonna put it out there. I'm just gonna, gonna put it out there. Wow. No, I'm gonna send people over to her show. Is what's going on. She she did a podcast with a major announcement about Defy Wrestling. Uh, and uh, I mean, like it's Defy Wrestling. We just had Matt Farmer on the show. But uh, if you want to know what she did, what she dropped, you need to go listen to her show. So. Yes, check out Denise Salcedo. Uh, I know for sure her uh, most recent interview is on YouTube. Um, you should check it out. I know Defy Wrestling has shared it. Um, so you can check out Defy social media as well. And yes, as, as Brendan is mentioning, she did break some pretty big news um, concerning some talent uh, coming to Defy. We're just not going to spoil it for you here. 
Um, <laughs> just go ahead and check it out. But we do definitely try and support our Lucha Central brothers and sisters. And so a big announcement um, that Denise Salcedo brought to light for Defy. She also will be a the host for the meet and greet for PCW Ultra. For those of you who are interested in visiting or going to PCW Ultra or being part of that meet and greet, she will be your host. So um, Denise Salcedo continuing to kill it out there in uh, you know the pro wrestling community. We're super proud of her and uh, definitely can't wait to see what other interviews she brings to light. Um, but you know what? We're going to focus on the present. We're going to focus on the now by talking about the past, which is very confusing. <laughs> but this will make sense in a few minutes. Uh, so now we are actually bringing up a promotion that I think this is the first time that has started off our you know, regular show. And that's Ring of Honor. So let's just take a moment. A big congratulations to Ring of Honor uh, for their Death Before Dishonor show, because that is what Brendan is going to recap. Um, but as we've talked about, we always like to really change our formula and our lineup to acknowledge the promotions that are doing Lucha Libre well, that have very big weeks in Lucha Libre um, with their talent and with their shows. And ROH is absolutely one who killed it this week. So, Brendan, go ahead and take it away with this week in Ring of Honor. Well, this is where it gets even better. Like, it's not just Death Before Dishonor. Before that, you had the TV taping this weekend, which had two Lucha-centric matches on it that were also barn burners. You had Rey Orus and Banditos against the Briscoes. And then you had LFI in a tag team title match against... uh Violence, uh, consisting of Chris Dickinson and Homicide this time for the titles and LFI did win that match. So they went into Death Before Dishonor with, uh, Dragon Lee and Kenny King as the tag team champions, making Dragon Lee one of the few people to have multiple belts at the same time in all of Ring of Honor. So when we were talking about the, you know, PWI rankings, if he doesn't move up next year based on just the last two weeks alone, uh, he's, uh, he's something that's not right with that voting process. He's, so he is now the world TV champion and the ty- and the tag team champion going into that. And they made that decision to not have him wrestle twice this weekend because, uh, they were keeping other people from wrestling twice. So they wanted it to be consistent and have everybody wrestling only one match on the pay-per-view. Uh, so now we can move on to what happened at Death Before Dishonor. They started off in the first hour, which was completely free and is available on YouTube, with the Honor Rumble, which is – it's a rumble. So if you've watched the WWE's Royal Rumble or if you've watched any of the AAA or CMLL variants, it's very much the same thing. New wrestlers pop up. Uh, people get eliminated. This, in this one, you, it's by being thrown over the top rope. Uh, the, uh, winner of this goes on to face the champion, who is, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a spoiler, it's Bandito. Uh, at, at the, uh, at, at a future date. This one they specified is gonna be on TV, so we're gonna see this on TV. Uh, there were a number of luchadors that popped up, but the surprise entrant that I was – one of the surprise entrants I was alluding to earlier is Alex Zane, uh, who went by Ari Blake on 205 Live, is the, came out on top, won this one, and will be facing Dragon Lee – or not Dragon Lee, Bandito in the future. Uh, so there you go, Dusty. You got one of the, the big indie names back in yeah. kind of the indie circuit. Very exciting. Uh, that's how I became aware of Bandito. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. American Indie appearances, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then later in the night, uh, there, you had uh, LFI consisting of uh, Bestia Del Ring, Kenny King, and uh, – why did the name just shoot right out of my head? Uh, and, and Dragon Lee uh, trying for the six-man titles. Against Shane Taylor Enterprises, uh, they this it was interesting to me. They very clearly are pivoting towards the more Kenny King centered storyline. Uh, 
Kenny King and Shane Taylor have a history is uh, official becoming a member of LFI was centered around him using a chair on Shane Taylor. This match was focused more on that. It uh, kind of makes me think that uh, ROH might be hedging their bets and uh, because if uh, LFI members do not renew their contracts, uh, you know, Roosh or Dragon Lee or any of them, they can still have a feud going on with Kenny King. Unfortunately, uh, for us Lucha fans, LFI did not win this one. They, they had a fantastic, brutal style match. Well, uh, lots of, uh, interference. Shane Taylor was taken out before the match even started, so he was replaced, but that set the tone where we were gonna use chairs and the entire arena to, to beat each other up. <laughs> um, but the end result, as I mentioned, was that LFI fell just a little bit short, and they uh, do not, uh, Dragon Lee did not become a triple champion, which would have made him only the second person to have had three belts at the same time. There's still time. Still time. Uh, and then we had the show stealer, the, the one that, uh, I went in knowing that I was going to enjoy, but I didn't know that in a card that had Beth Tito in a four way elimination match was still going to come out as my pick for match of the night. And this was Roxy and Miranda Alize for the, the women's mm-hmm. championship. Um, we've talked a lot about just how young and surprising it was that they put them in this position, but this match showed me a thousand percent why the people at ROH believed that this should be the match. This was an amazing, amazing match that went um, back and forth. It went long. I, I bid on every false finish. Uh, I mean, they, they did it great. They had, uh, Roxy is positioned firmly in a baby face position, which those of you who are familiar with her career was a little disconcerting at first. But by the end, I was, I was into it and I was, I was happy that she won. So I don't, uh, I, Miranda, you know, you've worked with, uh, with these ladies. Do you have any thoughts on this match? Uh, well, I have definitely, I have not worked with with Roxy and had very you know kind of a, a limited uh, interaction with Miranda Alize what I would say is that in what I saw of this match it was kind of a tit for tat anything you can do I can mm-hmm. do too mm-hmm. and I think Miranda was really trying to play up her lucha libre experience and her Fair agility much. um to kind of show Roxy like I have more experience than you I'm better than you and Roxy was able to meet her every single time mm-hmm. and so I feel like it was very much a uh you know an under um appreciation i don't even know appreciation but you know being to 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 look at roxy and not take her seriously is what it felt like mm-hmm. in that match with her and miranda alizé i have to admit i did not expect roxy to win i did not expect her to make it this far in the tournament you know i truly thought that miranda alizé was going to win so i was shocked and that's something i think that's still very rare in the world of professional wrestling to do is to shock fans but yeah. um, i think that it's you know really positive and uplifting message uh for ring of honor to have someone of you know so young but of excellent caliber as their champion right now and a great way to turn the page uh, on the women's division so you know we do know that roxy and miranda alizé have signed deals as long with some other women so we're going to have a still a fairly robust women's division and they've set up some great stories and moments for the future, which ultimately I think that's what it's about. You know, you get to this pinnacle of, of crowning a new champion, but now it's what's next. And I think that crowning Roxy, especially as a super over baby face, really sets up a whole line of challengers in the future with yeah. Miranda Alizé, with, of course, you have Angelina Love and Mandy Leone lurking. Then you have Maxi Impaler still around. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a, a lot of people still in the wings. Even if you bring back a Maserati and a Kosovoy, 
You know, you have a whole line of people who you can bring in to do short term storytelling long term. And so in thinking about that, it makes sense on the decision they made. But the match itself, I thought, you know, if you do like a lot of back and forth action, even a little bit spotty, you know, which, again, is nothing wrong. I feel like I'm just trying to utilize some of my words to describe that match. Um, Then this is a fun one to watch. Yeah, and you're very right. They the announcers co- covered it too. They were very definitely playing up the lucha style, which is one of the reasons that we talk so much about these women on this. They're not just a lucha. Miranda Alize in particular is not just lucha adjacent. She is 100% yes. lucha, and she's playing that playing into that in this match a lot well she she has throughout the entire tournament you know she has deemed herself the lucha baddie like that Mm -hmm. is a core element of her identity and i think what's led her to her success is that agility is that quickness is Mm -hmm. you know the uh, ability to think in that um you know lucha and bring that lucha side out of her um and she just found someone else who also can speak lucha as as you say and um (laughs) can can go with you know that that met her in the ring where she was at and she really was um you know someone that was very underestimated i think that is that's the word i was trying to find earlier um randa alizé very much underestimated roxy's abilities yeah and that was a story that clearly played out where she was a little overconfident at the beginning. Then she, then as things got a little more serious, she stepped up the game. But again, even when she stepped up the game, Roxy met her. It was, it's very good, uh, technical match. It was very good storytelling match. Like this is, if you wanna, if you wanna learn a good way to, to, to set up a match or as a fan to kind of diagnose a match, I feel like this is a good match to, to watch for it. Um, we could, I can talk about this match a lot more, but I do, there was a main event too, and that was Bandito in a four-way elimination match. So you had EC3, Demonic Flamita, and Brody King all trying to beat Bandito for the world title. And I loved that this was an elimination match. That gave me, uh, for those of you who haven't, <sighs> haven't seen uh, too many of them they haven't done a lot of them recently and in bigger promotions people being eliminated one at a time really changes the the vibe of the match like it's not about a frantic run to get any pinfall or submission there's you, you know let's pretend you eliminate Brody King first that's not how it happened you still have to get Flamita and and EC3 out of the way in order, if you're Bandito to win, or, you know, it just, it just cha- changes, uh, whether, how many angles that, that <laughs> punch to the back of the head could come from. And they, they played that up really well. You had EC3 eliminated on a disqualification that, uh, Demonic Flamita sort of, uh, manipulated him into. So, uh, kind of, you know, I felt the Eddie Guerrero moment on that. I, I really enjoyed it. And uh, then you had Brody King as the last one in there. So he was matching Bandito power for power. But you had a different story with each person that was eliminated. Bandito had to worry about the madness of EC3. He had to worry about Demonic Flamita's just complete knowledge of him in this. Uh, there was even a point where uh, the the two of them were operating together as Mexablood and... Uh, they were on, they were in sync and on point, like more than during the whole storyline where things were falling apart. And, uh, to me, what was interesting was Bandito was the one that, that went, that turned that relationship south. He, he betrayed Demonic Flamita before Demonic Flamita could do it. So he do, is showing that he has a little bit of a, kind of a bad edge to him, a rough edge. So, uh, again, this was a fun match. Really, really good. But, uh, Bandito is still the champion. Uh, so, I mean, all in all, a great match. Uh, and it, they, they hung their hat on two luchadors in the main event here. Um, even more though, we're having more of this. And the next big, uh, the next event that happens here is, uh, this weekend, 
the uh, ROH championship is going to be on the line at a big lucha event down, which is Bandito's gym down in Mexico, and it's going to have a ROH versus uh, versus big big lucha kind of theme to it, where you have Delirious and Skyade, which I mean, it doesn't say it on the poster, but if that's not billed as a Maestro's match, then they are missing a booking opportunity because those are two guys who have made careers teaching other people how to be top of the game. Like they, they both have taught, they to, they both taught people that were in the main of the event of that ROH match. Uh, and then you have Flamita against Emperor Azteca against, uh, uh, oh, Flamita and Emperor Azteca against the Briscoes in, in another match. You have a three-way with Commander, PJ Black, and Cyclone Ramirez. And then you have Bandito defending against Matt Taven. And I wanted to touch on this. Matt Taven had a, had a very popular CMLL run. He is still talked about with a lot of respect in, in Mexico. So, uh, it, he, by the definitions that we talked about earlier, he could be eligible for a Lucha Libre award. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, he, you know, that's going to be a big, big weekend. And I just, this is all part of the massive package of why ROH is here. At, just to use the, the terminology at the top of the card, we're talking about them first to make sure we have plenty of time to cover all of this. Um, I'm just going to, before we move on, do you guys have any more thoughts on the past, present or future of ROH and Lucha based on what we've presented today? Um well, we've kind of talked about it before, how WWE's kind of slacking in the Lucha thing, and really, it was up for the taking. We saw with Lucha Underground, mm-hmm. a lot of people want Lucha content every week, and pure Lucha content. Like, they don't want WWE-style Lucha content. So I think that Ring of Honor should embrace this going yeah. forward as hard as they can, because it gives them a unique edge that nobody else has. The Azteca Underground thing is coming into it, but the Ring of Honor style Lucha is very different from what we know of Lucha Underground. And so hopefully they'll have their own distinct flavors, but lots of Lucha is good for everybody. It's good for us as fans. It's good for the other Luchadors. It's good for competition. Yeah, I just really hope that they push hard into the Lucha thing going forward. It's also one of the best indie markets around if you're going to look for guys that aren't necessarily signed. It's true Lucha's enough. It's just got a ton of guys. Yeah, and and uh, CMLL not so much, but AAA is pretty permissive with uh, it, American indie circuits. So you can theoretically work for a big promotion in Mexico and still come up to America for a little bit of a payday. Yeah. All right, so that's that's my ROH. Um, I, I rambled on a lot because there was a lot to cover, but just an exciting weekend. And there's going to be more. There will be more matches on TV this week. They, uh, Other than the Big Lucha show, they're mostly going to be focusing on TV for like six or so weeks. So just keep an eye on the TV product there, and uh, you should be seeing most of the Lucha content that's coming out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Brendan, for that ROH news. Up next, we're going to jump over to AEW with Dusty. Yeah, we oddly had a lot, but not a lot of Lucha content at <laughs> AEW this week. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get there as we come to it. But first up, last week, between the time we recorded and you heard our show, Rampage dropped. And like, Oh my gosh, such a good match. It, we knew it would be an incredible match. Like, it, that it could be at least and should be. And, and thankfully it was. But it was also the first time to me that it felt like AEW really made Andrade feel like a big star. Like, or a big deal. And some of that was just his natural charisma and ability in the ring. But more than that, they he really, like his confidence in the ring seemed to be better than it had in a long time. And we got these subtle signs from AEW that they also think he's a big deal, that he should be confident because he got that big win over Pac. After the match, he attacked Chavo. Chavo had been instrumental in delaying Pac's travel and messing things up with the All Out show. And so, you know, everything 
went crazy there. He fired Chavo, attacked him. Then he apparently, I don't know, no official word, but to me it looked like maybe Andrade was turning face by firing Chavo. And then he turned Chavo loose to pack and the Lucha Bros. They gave him some super kicks and, you know, worked him over. And this all seemingly opens the door to Ric Flair showing up to manage Andrade like he did in Mexico. I think that's where all this is going. Tony Khan is a Ric Flair fan, but we had a since like as we're recording this, there is an episode of Dark Side of the Ring about the plane ride from hell. And so we may see AEW kind of waiting for the fallout on Ric Flair to see what happens. But <laughs> if, 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 if it's okay, like if Ric Flair comes out of it, I feel like there is no higher profile pairing they could give Andrade in the world. Like Ric Flair comes with an instant cachet of credibility and being the man. You know, like Ric yeah. Flair was the man for so long. And he gives Andrade that rub. He's here, you know, son-in-law. He wants to manage him. And, and Ric Flair's a smart guy. He goes where the money is, where the shine is. And everybody kind of knows that Ric Flair is an opportunist like that. So to see him with Andrade actually is quite a rub to Andrade because this is the guy that Ric Flair wants to get the shine from. Such a cool to be in. And I really hope we get to see more going forward. It's a real shame we didn't get this match at all out. I don't necessarily think it would have been the best match on the card. Well, I don't, because how can you outdo that Young Bucks versus Lucha Bros? But I do think it would have been in the top three matches on the card. Shame it was left off, but what a what a match and such a cool spot for Rampage last week. We'll see what comes of it. Then this week on Tuesday, Dark Elevation had no real Lucha content Monday night. Tuesday Dark, however, we had some classic style Lucha Libre. Fuego Del Sol versus the mysterious Mulvado. This was such a cool, fun match. I've talked about this before, but so far, AEW have found a great balance between using Dark to kind of build Fuego up as an underdog and then Rampage to kind of knock him back down. And they just do a great job. When he gets his win, he still feels like an underdog. Excellent work with Fuego Del Sol. This was a classic Saturday morning style match. Like, if you've seen those Saturday morning matches, or like those, especially those Saturday morning Memphis matches, you know what I'm talking about. In the very best way, you had a very clear good guy who's a lovable underdog. He's the fan favorite. He's everybody's you know, choice to win. You have a very clear bad guy. He's tough in the beginning. Underdog overcomes that, and then he beats the bad guy. It's a classic story, and it's a fun story. And it is so easy to tell in the ring that we kind of forget how exciting it is to see that story play out in the ring. And also, I wanted to note they have now moved into the AEW Dark Zone at Universal Studios. I actually love the look. I love the setup for Dark now. It's a great atmosphere, and it's a, definitely a throwback to the WCW Worldwide tapings and the Impact Zone and everything that were at Universal Studios. And just a nice nod to history while also being a great home for Dark. It was Especially with the Rampage tapings, it was a long show to see Dark, the show, then Dark Elevation, or Dark D Dynamite, rather, then Dark Elevation. Now that they're taping Dark and special tapings, you get fans that are diehard fans, but you would also get some casuals that come in. At least that's how it worked during the WCW era. And I hope that we, you know, really get to see maybe a little more development of that. Obviously, one of the most memorable parts of the WCW era was when they were recording there at Universal and the, uh, the NWO ran in. Rey Mysterio was picked up and thrown like a dart into the side of a trailer. It stood out in my mind ever since, lives rent free in my head all the time. So I'm hoping that we'll get to see a lot of the outdoor and surroundings and things that kind of played into it but it's a nice addition to the impact zone or to the aw dark zone so then also dynamite no real lucha content however i got the rampage spoilers i have a friend in boston he was in the crowd they taped rampage he gave me his notes 
so that I can give them to you. You'll probably have seen this by the time the podcast drops, but at least this way we've got it covered. We had Lucha Bros defeating the Butcher and the Blade, and what I'm told was a surprisingly great match. After the match, Hardy Family Office runs in to beat down the Lucha Bros. Proud and Powerful then run in to make the save. I feel this is building to a big 4x4 tag match at Grand Slam. I don't know if it will be on Rampage or Dynamite. I We've seen two weeks now that we haven't had the Lucha Bros on Dynamite. I feel that what they're really aiming for at this point is trying to push Rampage as like a must-see show. This is the the show where things happen. We saw the Kenny Omega Christian title change happen on a Rampage. So Andrade versus Pac was on Rampage. It just kind of makes sense that they're trying to guide eyes over to this new product as well. Hopefully, it doesn't even feel like the B show right now, but hopefully the Lucha Bros aren't seen as not being worthy for Dynamite because this sounds like a fantastic match. And I really want to see them go far as tag team champions, no matter what program they're on. Also in Lucha News for Rampage, we had Miro defeating, defeating Fuego Del Sol. Again, they said this was the main event. This was a really fun main event where Fuego got a lot of offense in. The crowd was very into Fuego, but Miro caught him in the game over. And after the match and wouldn't release it, Sammy ran in to make the save. Also during Rampage, the AEW logo is back on the mat for the ring. So the canvas has the AEW logo again like it did in the early days. Like the promotional materials, the toys and everything had the same look. Just a nice, fun spot. Little throwback thing. I like that it's coming all around again. A lot going on in AEW. Feels like there's going to be more Lucha stuff going on in the future. But right now, that's all they gave us. Check in at LuchaCentral.com every week for more information and news. They'll have it as soon as it hits. We will have it for you every week on the podcast. So check back with us, too. Same Lucha time, same Lucha channel. I I just wanted to say real quick, uh, I feel like we need to redefine what the main event is on Rampage because it seems like, (laughs) yeah, it seems like the big match is the first match on Rampage. Yeah, they 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 do things a little bit different on Rampage. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, nothing against Fuego del Sol, but I didn't think that he was going to win the first time. I didn't think he was going to win the second time, even though I think he bet his car. Yeah, uh, making it. Kind of an apuestas match, but <laughs> um, well, and he won with you know, the tornado DT, DDT on dark, so they're giving yeah. him the you know I mean like well, it, it's yeah. not impossible, but yeah, it it did feel impossible that he was going to beat Miro to beat Miro because they've also made Miro kind of this unstoppable force again. Um, yeah, and, he's a, yeah the monster again, and I I love it, love his yeah. character. But so to the point I was making was that that was not it didn't feel as much like a main event as the opening match did. So I, I right. rampage, yeah, I rampage. See, they seem to put the 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 big match first, maybe so it has more time in case it goes long. Because there's nothing worse than the old WCW ending. Fans, we gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, fans, we're out of time. Oh, yeah. Oh. I always hated that. There's there's still a match that lives in my head from the the days of that. Nikita Koloff had just gotten his hands on the chain uh to save Dusty Rhodes from the other Russians and then they went off the air and like so it's, that's still in my head all this time. I I I I can I can see it uh, over and over again. I just don't want to relive that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> deep cuts, deep cuts. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't no. We were yeah. trying to finish the AEW segment, but I really felt like that was an important part of the discussion. No, it's yeah. true. And it, and obviously the title match should be, I, at least I assume it was a title match, but your tag team champions, rather, your champions in the match should yeah. always be the main event. Like, even if it's the first match on the card, that should be the main event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Well, speaking of changes to formats, we have a new NXT, NXT 2.0 to be exact. 
This week was the launch of NXT, the relaunch of NXT. And that came with a new set, that came with a new logo, new music, all of that. So before we delve into what happened on NXT, I just want to get your quick thoughts on the new look. We talked about the logo uh, last week, and that was just one bit of it. But what are your guys' thoughts on the new format and layout of the arena? Because it is very different. It is does feel very much like a studio show. Um very similar to to what you we had seen on dark um so right. there's definitely something to it but you know with this change to nxt in general all of this happening at once just what what were your thoughts on it this week dusty i'll, I'll jump to you first i i actually liked the studio feel of it especially yeah. it gave it more of a developmental feel and you know like dark is in the studio so maybe you know that's kind of the vibe now is that developmental yeah. is in the studio i liked that I thought the lighting was a little bit too much like a lava lamp or a, mm-hmm. like a mood ring or something. <laughs> yeah, like well, it it's interesting colors because uh-huh. when you think about the way that the colors, the, the screens are project a lot of light. And yes, so the do. fact that the screens are now multicolor gives all those colors off in the arena. So I ex- know exactly what you mean by that. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it was just, yeah, very, yeah, like a mood ring. It had a, the feel was interesting though, and the unique feel and the lighting and everything. I, I don't know how I feel about it yet. I didn't immediately love it, but I didn't hate it at the same time either. And it feels like giving NXT its own unique presentation has always been part of the deal, but I don't know. It, it makes it feel less important or less gritty than it used to, but it also makes it feel more uh, mass consumable. Yes. Very good point. Brendan, what are your thoughts on the redesign of NXT? So I actually avoided watching it, uh, but I just, I mean, I wanted to, I can touch on this. The studio wrestling is has got a long-standing history the old nwa shows including the one i just referenced were all shot in studios they it's it it may be the new thing to to do it but i feel like it is a nice connection to the roots and history of 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 wrestling to have an obvious studio instead of like the 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 performance center that was dressed up to look like a studio and Mm -hmm. uh uh, you know, I I feel like maybe if they can just put a little bit of that emphasis on on kind of that that kind of tradition, you add a little extra something uh, kind of intangible to to the performance. So I I'm a little more excited to 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 watch it now, hearing that you, both of you say that it's got kind of more of a studio feel. Yeah. Well, with that, we didn't get too much Lucha Libre action. Actually, one of the matches that was promoted for this show was Frankie Monet versus Raquel Gonzalez, and we didn't get that. We didn't get an explanation as to why it didn't happen, which we've seen with WWE over the past month or so, where you've had matches advertised and they either fall through or just don't get acknowledged at all. So... I'm trying to stay cautiously optimistic. That means maybe we can stretch this out a little bit longer. Maybe this means we'll get more of a longer feud with them right. and a bigger buildup. Um, and and that should be it. But, you know, who knows? <laughs> this also could be WWE just, you know, shaking some things up and changing their minds um, about what to air and what to have that night. So we did not get Frankie Monet versus Raquel Gonzalez. However, we did get uh, the debut of B-Fab from Hit Row versus Katrina Cortez, who I believe is um, the Chilean luchadora um, based out of NXT. We uh, She also did have a match on 205 Live this week as well. Um, and so that was very interesting to see uh, a more of a variety of matches on 205 Live. But going back to this match, it was pretty much a squash. And... You know, a a lot of the consensus or feedback online has been that it wasn't a a great match, uh, mainly because 
you have B Fab, who I, I don't know what her background is in as far as how many matches she's had, but there was things about it that didn't look very clean. Some very weird approaches with her, you know, leg movements as far as the big kicks. I understand wanting to do something a little bit different. Um, but they felt very disjointed. The chemistry was not there with Katrina. Um, I haven't seen Katrina wrestle very much either, but she did not, it just did not gel and vibe. Um, B Fab won with a neck breaker that Katrina just barely sold. And I don't know, I don't, I don't mean that in an unintentional way that, you know, she was trying to, you know, go all Goldberg or Ultimate Warrior on it. But the way that she landed on her knees almost, and she was moving before that three count happened. So, like, I couldn't have imagined her actually going through with that three count. If there was going to be another maneuver, I figured it would be something a little bit more powerful, something different. But it is what it is. Ultimately, though, this match had more of a means to an end as Legado de Fantasma came out. And B-Fab addressed Electra Lopez, uh, who was out there, and they had a back and forth. So we know we're building up for, to B-Fab versus Electra. I like this new chapter in the Legato Hit Row feud that now we're focusing on the women uh, a little bit more um, because you could always go back to the men, but to really hone in and, and develop some more hatred between the women will make this feud go longer. But again, I, I am a little worried that you can get an amazing match out of Santos and Isaiah Swerve Scott, period. Um, but when you have maybe some of your more inexperienced members in there, especially one on one, that could be kind of tricky to do. And and it won't be all alone because, again, you know, we're going to have some input from these two teams. And also this does better help build what we've been dream booking is a war games between Legato and Hit Row. Yeah. So if you build up the women to us and it really helps build up, up, I mean, again, this is dream booking. Who knows if we're going to get war games in in NXT 2.0? That's a whole other thing that hasn't really been addressed is what our takeover is going to look like now. Um, So it almost will absolutely piss me off if we get rid of war games right when, you know, we we have two new factions that you could build a, a whole war games around i'm a lot less optimistic because if the rumors are true vince is heavily involved and vince very clearly does not support intergender wrestling like Mm -hmm. wwe does mixed tags they don't do intergender tags Uh, apparently that's because of their toy licensing deal they have an agreement with mattel that a man will never put his hands on a woman in violence without their prior approval well like yeah like becky lynch taking the end of days and stuff like that like mattel had to approve that you know it's hard to tell what is real and and what is you know yeah. you know it's hard it's hard to know like what really cuz then you are also dealing with NXT which is a very different brand and so who who knows but anyways the point i guess is more i can understand why the focus is now on the women to help mm-hmm. you know just add more to this feud between uh, these two factions i'm still there and i'm still on social media pushing for it yes i'm just Allowing a little more uh, room for maybe this isn't the Christmas yeah. present I should look for under yeah. the Christmas tree this year. Now, again, this also notes a pretty big week for Katrina. As I mentioned, she was also on 205 Live. I have not watched her 205 Live match, so I would definitely want to watch that to see how that went differently than this match with BFAB. Um, because that is kind of the, the sour note on this is that that match between BFAB and Katrina wasn't uh you know a caliber that i had hoped for for both of them um even in a squatch match you know that means you have less moves but you have to be more precise and and clean Mm -hmm. and strong and that definitely too you could absolutely have played more of that strength game on bfab just because she had the obvious strength and size advantage against katrina so those are just you know Minor things for NXT this week, but it is official. We have the the launch of NXT 2.0. That also encompassed, uh, you know, a new NXT champion with Tommaso Ciampa um, after 
Uh, Samoa Joe vacated the championship over the weekend. We got a wrestling wedding that actually went through and was happy. So I think that's the swerve of all swerves is to actually go through with a wedding. Um, I mean, they have to go through it, you know, once every God, 30 years was the last successful wedding, Macho and Liz. I can't even, you know, remember, but um, that's the fact that that's the swerve. At the same time, I do not enjoy the fact that now this index marriage is in the same conversation as Macho Man and Elizabeth. Like, they are not the same event by any stretch of the not imagination. Absolutely not the same event, but it was it's now the only reason I think it's in the same conversation is because right. it's one of the only weddings that actually went through. It's, no, you're right. It's just, but that's, you know, yeah. the tradition since then has been wrestling well, go terrible. But that's well, also, you know, the thing, we, we <laughs> very much live in a, a different society now and weird is good. I, People yeah. love weird and off and different. Yes. And I think index represents a lot more about modern love, uh, <laughs> especially on television <laughs> than a lot of, you know, than I'm sure at the time Macho Man and, and Miss Elizabeth was very much on the days of grand soap operas uh-huh. and yeah. grand love, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. and now we live in a world of Netflix and Hulu and, you know, Oxygen very network. Uh, yeah. very oh. off the wall representations of love you know the bachelor love of their lockup you know like literally everything uh, so, yeah you know. you're not wrong when you put it i just uh, i don't know it yeah, just, i get yeah. it i get it i, get it. I and i and i don't hate this i hate i love the the, I, the quirky relationship i've been waiting for it to get a little bit goofy and silly and I kind of that was kind of more like I just wanted it to get a little goofy and silly like it could maybe have gone off without a hitch and then something goofy happened that would have been cool I just yeah it's weird it's wrestling weddings not going weird it's just I mean Chelsea Green built a career off of this yeah <laughs> true if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it, kids. Yes, it's Google hot it. mess, Laurel Van Ness, yes. y'all. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that was this week in NXT. Up next, we are going to jump to AAA news with Dusty. Yeah, not a whole lot of news, but the full card for Heroes and Mortales was finally announced. It'll be happening Saturday night, October the 9th, 2021, and there will be five, count them, five trios matches one tag team match, and one Copa slash Battle Royal style match. No singles or a Puestas matches anywhere on the card. The first match is Fabi Apache, Mr. Iguana, and Nino Ambergesa versus Io Del Tarantes, Parca Negra, and Superfly, and a trios match that is sure to be one of the strongest highlights of the night solely because of the inclusion of friend of the show, Copa Triple Mania winner, and this year's <laughs> Mr. PWI 497 and climbing, Mr. Iguana. The second I have a of counterpoint the- to that. Okay. <laughs> Dio de Torrentes is on the other side of the ring. That is I, a I referee, like ladies and gentlemen. His, yeah. <laughs> And it, it, once in a while, the refs get involved, but this is like fairly rare for a, you know, like a professional oh, wrestling thing. But yeah, if it was going to be anybody, it'd be Tarantes. Like, yeah, yes. he's, and he's Butter had a long standing, like a five year feud, which has included some matches with Fabi Apache. So there's a yeah. reason for it. But there's a reason that he is a wrestler. He's a <laughs> ref and not a wrestler. So yeah. just. <laughs> It'll be um, interesting, at least. <laughs> people who know me know that I love him, so I am not being. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm well, that's being, my thing with yeah. Mister Iguana's comedy skills. I feel like maybe Toronto, like his mix of like yeah. danger and comedy. Mm-hmm. I feel like maybe he could kind of help Toronto's, you know, help kind of carry the weight of that, and they'd be good foils for each other. I guess is what I'm saying. So maybe they'll play off of each other well in this one. I, I, I'm internally optimistic because uh, <laughs> Ferrantes is a great character. He's not a great wrestler, but he's a great character. Absolutely. He's in there 
Fabi can carry him on the wrestling and, and, and he can play with Mr. Iguana. So it could actually be really good. But that if there is an albatross, it is Mr. Suspenders. Junior. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, the second match is actually, I mean, it, it, it'll be very good too. Very exciting. Some real contenders. We got the first trio of Armis, Mr. Cease Jr., and Octagon Jr. versus La Hydra, Rey Escorpion, and Taurus. Like, oh, that's gonna be an exciting match. Looking forward uh, to that. Next up, we got another trios match. This one, you know, I, if there's no cookie sheets, I'll be shocked. But we have Chessman. Lady Shawnee and Pagano versus Abismo Negro Jr., Cheek Tormenta, and Latigo. If, like I say, if there was a match on the card that called for cookie sheets, it'll be this one. Thanks. Next up, we're going to have probably the match of the night. I think this is the one that people are really going to be talking about for a while. We have the Lucha Bros, Phoenix, and Pentagon Jr. versus Il del Vikingo and Laredo Kid in a AAA tag title match. This is like, I am most excited for this match. I think this could be match of the year candidate very easily. So it'll be exciting to see what they pull off. We also have a Copa Antonio Pena. This is the Antonio Pena Memorial Show, if you recall. And it has some interesting inclusions this year as well as being an intergender, um, Copa. It pits Pimpinella Escarlata, Mamba, Keira, Sexy Star 2, Aerostar, Arhenus, Dave the Clown, Biano 3 Jr., and Ares, all against each other in one Copa. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. They've done a lot better with these Copas in the last couple of shows than they had in previous years, and so they've become something I look forward to. It used to just be the match where everybody got on the card. Now it's a match you don't want to miss. And our two big, you know, co-main event matches and the big feud, Porter Del Norte, Carta Brava Jr., Mocha Cota Jr., and Tito Santana versus the Nuevo Generacion Dinamita, Cuatrero, Forestero, and Sansone. That's going to be an exciting trios match. And then we also have La Empresa, DMT Azul, Puma King and Sam Adonis versus the Psycho Circus, Monster Clown, Murder Clown, Psycho Clown, and a rare cage match with no apuestas on the line. That's fairly uncommon in Lucha, not to have an apuesta in a cage match. So it's a Being pretty Psycho exciting Psycho Clown might lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good sign that Law and Price is going to win this one. <laughs> But if there's any new information and all the other AAA news and information, check out LuchaCentral.com. So it's the segment you know you love and you learn something a little bit every time. It is This Week in Lucha Libre History with Dusty. Yeah, we were just talking about Lucha Central, and here we are again. It's time for this week in Lucha Libre, and you know if I'm telling you that, that you've got to be sure and check in at LuchaCentral.com every single day. Pep Carrera, we've mentioned him earlier in the evening. He's got this day in Lucha Libre on there. There's information. There's birthdays. There's anniversaries. There's matches. There's videos. There's matches of the day, and even more, and everything on there is all about Lucha Libre, and it's at LuchaCentral.com. Com, your centralized place for all things Lucha Libre. This week we chose September the 15th, 2019, when AAA hosted Lucha Libre Invades New York. Lucha Libre Invades New York was a pay-per-view event that was produced and promoted by AAA in partnership with Impact Wrestling. It took place at the on September the 15th, 2019, as we mentioned, at Madison Square Garden's Hulu Theater in New York City, New York. This was only the third wrestling show third wrestling company to run shows at Madison Square Garden. Ring of Honor got the G1 Supercard there, and AAA was actually the third company after WWE to get a show there. Very exciting for them. And I'm, I'm going to focus on the women's match. It bound for glory. Tessa Blanchard, well, her and Ty had been feeding. Tessa retained the title by using the ring ropes at Bound for Glory. Three weeks later, Tyre received a rematch. Once again, Tessa won. She attacked the referee and got herself to... Yes, three weeks later, she was won by Tessa. She kept the title. She attacked the referee, got herself disqualified. At homecoming, then, she took 
it took that took place on January 6, 2019. Taya took the Impact Knockouts Championship after special guest referee Gail Kim, who had earlier attacked Tessa Blanchard in the match, performed her finishing move that allowed Taya to hit her finishing move, and then she pinned Tessa. So this was a rematch from Homecoming, this time for Tessa Blanchard's AAA Reina de Reinas Championship. Uh, yeah, for the tri- for Triple A Reina de Reina's championship, and it might have been like if you were an Impact fan at the time, it seemed like a little bit of an upset because Taya defeated Tessa for that Reina's title. This was really a hot rivalry at this point. It was pre issues with the Impact title and everything else with Tessa. So Tessa was really riding a high wave. Taya was kind of at the top of Triple A and had gone to Impact and really made a big splash there. She was coming back to Triple A. And in the feud before this, in Impact, Tessa had been the face at the time, but they had to switch for AAA because they knew a New York crowd, AAA, was not going to boo Taya. So she got to be the Technico in this match, which I thought was really cool. A nice spin from how things were going at the time for those of us that were watching both programs. Brendan, what did you think of this show? Well, you, you mean, you hit it on the head. That was the match that, uh, yeah, it was I, I almost, match. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, uh, ready to go across the country. And, and I mean, I would have been my first Madison Square Garden show if I'd been able to go, but that was the match that made me really seriously think about it. Like, I, I really wanted to see that. And yeah, like you said, it was a bit weird because they didn't, Triple A didn't act like she was, Taya was going to be a baby face until the day of the event, but man, you know, that crowd was behind it and they, they booked it like that and it was, it was fantastic. Um, and she had worked really hard, mind you, to, to be a heel <laughs> when she was on her way out of Triple A before. Yeah. Like, she had Maya the, was one of the best heels. Like, yeah. She was so yes. good when she had that Ruda run. Like, yes. Mm, fantastic. And and we got a little bit of everything. We got the brawling that was like really infamous in the her Hamada matches. We got the we got the technical stuff that we know that she and Tessa can do. Uh it was just generally it was a very solid match and it was the the I mean, there was a lot. The AAA did not, uh, did not shy away from content for this. They wanted to come in and make a big splash uh, and try and get a full to- foothold into America. And they probably would have if 2020 hadn't been a thing, uh, had a good foothold based off of the, the performance on, on this. They, they sold a lot of tickets. They got a lot of views online. There was a lot of buzz that day, but, uh, to, to, when I talk to people about the, the match, it's about the card. It's that match that everybody remembers. Uh, I'm yeah. going to toss it over to Miranda, but I suspect we're going to still be talking about this same match. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that and the other, another match was really caught my attention. I think with Taya and Tessa, it was, you know, also really showcasing two, uh, non Latina women you know, fighting in much more of a brawler style, but I think, you know, representing the pinnacle of lucha wrestling. It was kind of, and it's a weird dichotomy when I think about it. And I may be overanalyzing it. Um, but I think it was also the heatedness between their stories and how intense they were in the ring that sold me on it. I mean, they're two of the best in the entire world and they're both representing triple A. You know, so it also shows how serious AAA has taken women's wrestling and how, but it also makes sense when you think about an American audience, you know, like this made the most sense at that time for them uh, to have this showcase and how it just also, you know, kind of linked into other things like, you know, what's been happening at Impact and, and all of that. So my big thing, the one that I loved in the intro, the beginning was the Lucha Bros versus Santana and Ortiz. Um, because that reception that Penta got in that arena echoes what we hear now in AEW. And yeah, I think that, loved. yeah, the crowd loved him. And I think this match too is something that we still tease. I mean, we've seen it multiple times, 
already. But the fact that they're still so close again to doing it again just makes, you know, like just waiting patiently of when are we going to see this again? Because every time they're in the ring there, they work magic. It's because it's like almost like telekinetic beyond this higher power of communication and skill level between these four guys. But I do think now knowing what I know about, you know, AEW and that reception they get, I mean, they were already getting that mad pop back in 2019. So I do feel like it was, you know, AEW is making the right steps towards looking at the future of tag team wrestling in them. I hope all four of them really have a big foothold in the future of AEW's tag division because they can sell. They can work. They've done this. And just because they've done it before doesn't mean they not only can they do it again, but they can be better each time. I I think a lot of people forget now that we've seen them so much as a tag team, too, that they were like the two singles guys, like the two guys on Lucha Underground. Yeah. And so they, they can really do anything. That's what makes them so good. Like we saw in the match with the Young Bucks where they work together constantly, tandem wrestling. But we have also seen them, you know, in more traditional tag matches. Uh, they Just everything they do is so phenomenal and so effortless, and they are truly the best at what they do. Yes. Indeed. Well, that is this week in Lucha Libre history. Don't forget to check out this day in Lucha Libre at LuchaCentral.com. But wait, there is more. There's actually a lot more that you can see at LuchaCentral.com. Brendan, why don't you tell our listeners what they can find? All right, here we go. If you're listening to this and you haven't visited LuchaCentral.com, it's time to do it. LuchaCentral.com is the online home for Lucha Libre, where you can get all of the top news in English and in Spanish. Find the best curated video content and original content not seen anywhere else. Find when Lucha Libre events would be happening in your area. Find photo galleries from top photographers covering Lucha Libre around the world. A place to have your voices heard from all week... From Pardon me. Have your voices heard from weekly polls to annual awards seen and read by top executives in all of the major Lucha Libre promotions across the globe. And on top of all of that, it's free. I mean, come on, free, best price ever. LuchaCentral.com, your centralized place for all things Lucha Libre. Uh, up next, we do have this week in WWE with, you know, some interesting notes, a little bit of tidbits. So, Dusty, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, first up on SmackDown, we had a big tag match. Big E, Rick Boogs, Shinsuke Nakamura, Rey Mysterio, and Dominic defeated Apollo Crews, Otis, Bobby Roode, Dolph Ziggler, and Sami Zayn with Chad Gable. Commander Aziz and Trey Young at ringside. This was a match, and it happened, and it was a thing. Huh. It was an otherwise very, pretty good, not very good, but pretty good episode of SmackDown. And and in this match, we only had the two luchadors on SmackDown, but it didn't feel like a great match. It felt like a way to cram a bunch of names onto the card at Madison Square Garden. And it just came across that way the entire time. It wasn't didn't last long. However, to be positive, I'm looking for the positives in WWE right now. To be positive, this means that Dominic technically has a win over Sami Zayn now and it happened in Madison Square Garden. So nobody can take that away from him. That's a no. that's a High, high mark there, a nice achievement. And then also on SmackDown, newsworthy for what didn't happen, Zelina's match was cut. And, like, so strange, Zelina and Carmella were supposed to have a tag match against Liv Morgan and Tony Storm. With all the 9-11 tributes that WWE chose to air throughout the show, they couldn't in some way have thought to include Zelina Vega, who literally lost her dad in the Twin Towers on 9-11. And the next morning, she was at the 9-11 20th anniversary memorial, reading the names of the lost. 
They had nothing for her on the 9-11 memorial show of SmackDown in New York. Blows my mind. At this point, I feel like WWE is purposefully dropping the ball on things to see how far they can go before annoying the kind of smart fans and the internet fans affects the casual viewership. It, the mistakes they're making are, I mean, this is amateur level stuff. They should be doing this. They were the best at this back in the day. WCW, they hardly ever marketed their, like when people were on other talk shows and things. WWE would beat that drum to death. If somebody was on Conan, you'd hear about it for two weeks, you know, on Raw and SmackDown. So the fact that they didn't use Zelina, I, I don't know. It, it just felt disgenuine and purposeful to me. On Raw, Carrion did not have a match this week, but he did have a vignette. He seems to be saddled with the devil's advocate gimmick now. We'll see how that goes. He said that most of us don't know who we are, but we know who we want to be. Then they showed a few quick clips of Carrion whooping that ass, and he said that he loves every second of the agony when he fights people, and that maybe he doesn't have an ultimate plan. He'll just destroy everyone and take what he wants. And since I'm trying to be positive at WWE and Carrion right now, I'm going to leave Raw at that. Not a big fan. But what I was a big fan of this week was main event. Our main event on main event was Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo against the Lucha House Party. So good. Main event just knows what I want. And what I want is Angel and Humberto. They're primos, cousins, you know, like they know each other. They came up together. They trained and practiced together for years. Them as a tag team is like a natural fit. If you're not going to do something with Karrion as a singles wrestler, pair them up because they are so good together. And and what I wanted was them against Lucha House Party. That was so good. Fun match, incredible match. Lince Dorado, he continues to be the most underrated wrestler in the WWE. He was so crisp and so effortless and fluid in this match. He he always looks good, but he especially was able to shine in this match against Humberto and Angel. The Luchador thing just works with them, obviously. They had such a great chemistry in the ring. The match itself, trying to choose a winner, it was a real Sophie's choice for me. I honestly couldn't pick who I wanted to win. I was just along for the ride. And despite a couple of near falls where it seemed very certain that Lucha House Party would get the win, Angel was able to hit the wing clipper on Lince and pick up the win on show main event. Seriously, it's the hidden jewel of WWE. You get everything that happened on Raw this week. You get everything that happened on SmackDown this week. You get an early five-minute match, a second ten-minute match, and it's the whole show is like 30 minutes long. It's like the perfect WWE program, and you don't have to watch Raw or SmackDown to know what happened. I highly encourage everybody to start checking out Main Event. That is where the wrestling is at in WWE. It's just it's my new favorite WWE program. And for WWE news and all the other news, check out LuchaCentral.com, your centralized place for all things Lucha Libre. Thank you for all that WWE news, Dusty. Uh, Brendan, I know we have a few CMLL notes to share. Well, I, I'm just going to focus with the – we have the anniversary show coming up, and this is the card. So remember, this was all by fan vote. So don't shoot me if you don't like the matches. <laughs> Blame yourselves. <laughs> yes. uh, first off, we have Templario versus Dragon Rojo Jr. for the Mexican middleweight title. Uh, it's, it should be solid. Titan and Volador versus Gamilio Diablo and Gamilio Diablo 2 for the vacant CMLL tag titles that um, Mystico left in the void or – Carice, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, then we we have Echicero against Ultimo Guerrero for the CMLL Heavyweight Championship. Uh, I yeah, that doesn't appear to be vacant, so uh, I probably Ultimo has it. Uh, <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> Handsome Ultimo Guerrero. <laughs> PWI ranked. PWI yeah. ranked. Highest ranking luchador of 2021. And it, uh, it was obviously his handsomeness that got him there. 
That's part of the criteria. I get it now. I understand. Uh, then we'll have Espiritu Negro and Ray Comita against Akuma and Espanto Jr. for the Mexican Tag Team Championship. And the ladies will have La Yarotita and Uvia against Dark Silhouetta and Reina Isis for the Mexican Women's Tag Championship. So that will be, I believe, this weekend. Uh, it should, it's, uh, should be available on YouTube. They're not AAA. They didn't get blocked. So you should be able to watch this. And we will be talking about the anniversary show, uh, coming up in, in the, a future episode, probably next week. Yeah. Very exciting. To uh, start the end of our show, we are now moving into the world of Impact Wrestling and some pretty big announcements this week. Uh, first off, we do have Victory Road happening exclusively on the Impact Plus app this Saturday. And there are a few matches to keep in mind for those, well, who want to watch that as I slowly delay myself in finding that information. Uh, we do have the Impact World Championship being defended. Christian Cage will be facing Ace Austin. Uh, we also are going to have, uh, Tasha Steeles and Savannah Evans versus DK and that's Rosemary and Havoc. Just announced earlier, we will see the Good Brothers defending the Impact World Tag Team titles against Rich Swan and Willie Mack at Victory Road as well. Um, and so if you are a Willie Mack fan, make sure you watch that show because he may become a tag team champion. Um, other things to note, really one of the bigger pieces of news this week um, is the announcement of the Knockouts Knockdown special coming back. Um, it will be taped this weekend, but will air on October 9th. And some pretty big announcements. First, we did get confirmation that the event will be headlined by a Monsters Ball match to pay tribute to Daphne, who passed away uh, recently, which I think is a great thing to to do. She had her time when uh, the company was TNA, uh, of course, in WCW, and she paved the way for a, a lot of women in pro wrestling. And um, Impact was really one of the first promotions to have women go through, you know, a wider range of matches, including a Monsters Ball match. So uh, the participants for that have not been announced, but we do know that's going to be the headliner of the show. Uh, Christy Hemi will also be back on the show. Just right now, it's been indicated that she is going to have a major role, but details haven't been announced. And one of the biggest pieces of news is that Mercedes Martinez will make her impact debut on this card as well. Put which her in that Monsters Ball, please. Monsters Ball, I think, you know, um, <laughs> eventually she should be in the lineup to face Deanna Parazzo for yeah. the Knockouts Championship. I know right now Deanna's in kind of a feud with Mickey, but they can kind of do her and Mickey in a long term, and maybe Mercedes comes in more short term. But I think that Impact is a great place for Mercedes to land. And I think we'll get to see more of a personality. I think Impact Wrestling is a very unique place where you see more personality of people that you didn't get to see before. And so I feel like we're going to see more of her in that setting. Um, but I also think, you know, seeing her in a match with Deanna Pratt. So I know that's happening on the independent scene uh, sometime. Uh, but to actually get that on television is a blessing. Um, they also just made an announcement about the announced team scheduled for the knockout knockdown special we are going to have mickey james um who's going to be serving as the color analyst uh and veda scott doing play-by-play -play commentary which i think is perfect veda is a fantastic commentator she's uh commentated for aew and all over the independent scene i think this is an ideal place for her and then your ring announcer for the show will be melissa santos uh and she is 
my absolute favorite. Um, I, I adored her in Lucha Underground. I adore her announcing, and I think that she is really one of the best out there. So uh, a big congratulations for Mel- uh, Melissa to be in this role, and she's going to do outstanding. She's not only going to do this show justice, but beyond that. And I think any time she gets in a ring, um, lots of fans get excited, but also get that Lucha Underground vibe um, because she really was the voice of Lucha Underground. As far as notes for this week's Impact Wrestling show, uh, I was not able to watch in time before this recording, but there are a few matches you may want to keep your eye on. Some pretty good Lucha content on this week's Impact Wrestling. You had the team of Decay, Crazy Steve, and Black Taurus. Versus Violent by Design. We also had TJP versus PD Williams. And a repeat match from BTI last week. John Schuyler versus Laredo Kid. So I am really glad to see this on the main show. It does seem like we are going to see more Laredo Kid at Impact Wrestling. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and so, again, you'll have to watch this week's Impact to find the results of these matches. Uh, but a pretty good week for Lucha Libre fans in Impact Wrestling, as far as women's wrestling fans as well, tag team wrestling fans, whatever kind of wrestling you like, it's a pretty good week to like it in Impact Wrestling. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned to Victory Road this Saturday. Of course, the knockouts knockdown special in October and this week in Impact each and every week on Thursdays on Access TV. The last and a final uh, update for the show is MLW, and they made also a big uh, announcement about Fightland, which is scheduled for October 2nd at the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia. They announced a four-way for the middleweight championship. The champion Myron Reed is set to defend his title against Tajiri, Ademis, and Adis. Uh, in a four way. So that is going to be a match to watch. Of course, you have two luchadors in there and Adis and Adimis. Uh, Tajiri, I mean, who's wrestled all over the world, who can wrestle almost any style of, of pro wrestling. And then, of course, your champion, Myron Reed. That's definitely going to be a match to watch. Um, and then we also did get uh, the names of the three final competitors for the Opera Cup. Uh, we will see Lee Moriarty in the tournament as well as Bobby Fish and Alex Shelley. So as we alluded to earlier in talking about Ring of Honor, some of these WWE releases slash independent agents or independent contractors are moving away, moving their way around the independent scene. I think Bobby Fish in the Opera Cup is a chef's kiss genius idea. Um, so I I dig it. I love it. And I'd be, be excited for it. But uh, real quick, what are your thoughts on enemies and oddies entering this four way match with Myron Reed and Tajiri? Um, a pretty high profile spot uh, for these two guys. Brendan, I'll, I'll let yeah. you go first. Uh, yeah. Like you say, it's a nice high profile spot. Uh You've got uh, Myron Reed, who's worked a lot with Luchadors, and then you have Tajiri, who is, you know, famous because of a career with a, a, a feud with a Luchador. So uh, I think you've got two of the best guys to help them really stand out in front of a, an American crowd. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, ex- I have nothing but the highest of expectations for, for this match. Yes. Dusty, what about you? Yeah, I agree. I we've seen what they can do. We we know what they can do. But I think that a lot of people haven't in the fact that Impact is willing to put them in or sorry, not Impact. But yeah, that uh, they're willing yeah. MLW. Uh, MLW is willing to put them in such a high profile spot and um you know, like to get eyes on them, to put them with these kind of legends of what they do. If you're into MLW, you likely know a lot of the history of wrestling and maybe a lot of the future too with some of the independent names and so i think that this level of investment is 
crucial to these guys, and I think it could be what makes them stars. All they've needed was a company to believe in them for a while. You know, like that's all they need. That was the missing piece. And now that they've got that, I think they could be superstars, genuinely. I'm very excited to see what comes out of MLW in the next few weeks as we head on over to Fightland. Uh, I really think they're making some big strides with their roster, with who they're bringing on board, but also with uh, their matches, the talent. And again, I mean, I always leave off. We still don't know what's happening with Azteca Underground. (laughs) Y'all making me wait too long for this. I have no more patience left in me, but I guess I'm going to have to keep on waiting until we get some answers. It's not Christmas yet. (sighs) Fine, I will keep on waiting, MLW. Uh, but we hope to bring a lot more MLW news to you in the upcoming weeks. And with that, well, we are done. Yes, another edition of the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast is in the books. Don't forget to check out LuchaCentral.com, your centralized place for all things Lucha Libre. And check out Lucha Central on social media, at Lucha Central on Facebook and Instagram, and at LuchaCentral.com on Twitter. You cannot forget about the YouTube page that has hours upon hours of content, including matches, interviews, and so much, much more just for you. And while you're doing that, well, go ahead and follow us on social media. Brendan, I'm sorry, let's start with Dusty. Can you <laughs> let our listeners know? I just have a, I have a rhythm. I have a thing and it messes up every time I, I just, I just am so used to yeah. my order and my sequence. Um, I could have gone with it, but I, my body just said, no, that's not the order we do things here. That's the little <laughs> OCD coming out in me. Um, so Dusty, can you let our listeners know where they can find you on social media? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm at facebook.com slash Dusty Murphy. And I'm also on Instagram at Dusty Murphy. And Brendan, where can our listeners find you? I am 321 t-shirt guy. That's the numbers, 321 t-shirt guy is all spelled out. And I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And I'm all over the Twitters. And me, Miranda Morales, you can find me at the hashtag Miranda on Instagram and Facebook, hashtag spelled out. And let us know your thoughts on the show, any content or ideas you have for future topics, things we should check out, things we should talk more about, whatever it may be. Reach out to us on social media. Also, don't forget that you can listen to our show on your favorite podcast streaming platform like iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. And if you do that, go ahead and do three things. You can go ahead and hit that notification button um, and subscribe so that way you get notified every time a new episode drops. You can leave us a five-star rating and a review. Let us know your thoughts. Give us some feedback. Let us know what you like and what you don't like about the show. Don't worry. We got some tough skin. We're pro wrestling fans anyways. (laughs) Um, But with that, well, that is the end of uh, tonight's show. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Don't worry. We will be back like we are each and every week with more Lucha Libre content. So for Dusty Murphy and Brendan Barr, I'm Miranda Morales, and thank you so much. We'll, We'll see you back here next week.